on behalf of uh, the unesco chair on community media at uh, university of hyderabad it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, third global dialogue on community media in the post pandemic world uh, these uh, series of dialogues are uh, brought to you in partnership uh, with the unesco regional office in delhi uh, as in the previous dialogues on south asia and australia these dialogues will focus on the grassroots communication work being done during the current uh, pandemic crisis by community radios around the world and to reflect on the future of community radio more broadly over the next month or two we will continue to host these uh, online uh, deliberations with uh, practitioners community radio broadcasters advocates of community radio network representatives and academics from africa south america latin america north america and uh, continental europe uh, we are incredibly grateful to everyone who has uh, responded so enthusiastically to participate in these dialogues today our focus uh, is on community radio in the uk and ireland uh, from the initial experiments with access radio to a couple of hundred uh, community radio stations maybe more uh, today the trajectory of community radio in the uk in uh, some ways parallels that of india especially with the history of colonial broadcasting as well as the public broadcasting framework that we have inherited uh, from from britain uh, one has also been following the community radio scene in ireland uh, which seems to have a somewhat uh, longer history uh, rosemary days books on community radio in ireland uh, including uh, the one with the evocative uh, title bicycle highway Uh, have over the years informed our understanding of the Irish community radio ecology. Uh, if you look at our panel today, you will see what uh, we call in Bollywood as a star-studded cast, with uh, prominent advocates and academics of community radio from the from the two from the two countries. Uh, some of whom have been very influential. in the international scene as well uh, i leave them to be introduced by our moderators who themselves are uh, no less eminent uh, let me just quickly introduce our moderators and then uh, they'll take over uh, to begin with uh, dr salvatore schifo salvo uh, is a deputy head of department department of communication and journalism the faculty of media and communication burnmouth university uk he has published uh, a series of articles and book chapters on british community radio and uh, on the european community media scene as well he is a former co-chair of community communication and alternative media section of iamcr and uh, been secretary and then vice president of the community media forum uh, europe and for both of those organizations he is now part of their advisory board and uh, we have uh, andrew oboil i mean i don't know if i pronounced the irish last name andrew my apologies uh, correctly uh, andrew is a faculty member at uh, the national university of ireland uh, galway where he also served as the founding station manager of the university radio station Flirt FM. He has been a member of the Irish Broadcasting Complaints Commission for three years. His academic work focuses on the political economy of the mass media, with a particular interest in the interplay of uh, technological change, regulation, and uh, not-for-profit media. And uh, one of the reasons we brought Salvo and Andrew together. Uh, to moderate this panel is that uh, he uh, Andrew has with uh, Salvo recently co-edited uh, two back-to-back -back special issues of the Journal of Alternative and Community Media on sustainable community media and has a set of very interesting articles 
uh, I strongly recommend uh, those to, to scholars and practitioners everywhere. Uh, so may I now request uh, the two moderators, uh, Andrew and Salvo, to introduce our panelists and uh, take the dialogue over. Over to you, uh, Andrew and Salvo. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, it's a, it's it's a, it's an honor to uh, to be here, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to uh, today's uh, discussion. As as uh, Vinod has noted, we have a really uh, great uh, set of panelists, uh, uh, star-studded indeed, and it is uh, it. I think it promises to be uh, to be uh, interesting. Uh, what what I'm going to do first is uh, is uh, introduce uh, give a brief introduction to our to the six panelists we have on uh, today, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll uh, go into a discussion with each of them uh, in turn. Um, with us, we have uh, Steve Buckley. Uh, Steve is the managing director of Community Media Solutions, a media development organisation working in the UK and internationally. Uh, he's the co-founder and chair of Sheffield Live, a community radio, local TV, and online media hub uh, for the Sheffield City region. Uh, he is a founder of the UK Community Media Association and its former chief executive, uh, played an instrumental role in bringing about the legal framework for community radio in the UK, and has served as president of the World Association of Community Broadcasters, uh, AMARC, uh, as well as authoring several publications on community media and media development, including UNESCO's Community Media uh, Good Practice Handbook and the International Comparative Study, Broadcasting Voice and Accountability, a public interest approach to po policy, law, and uh, regulation. Uh, with uh, Steve, we have uh, as well uh, Saldad uh, Galliana, uh, or Sally, uh, who has a degree in journalism from the Universidad Complutense in Madrid and a master in international relations uh, from Dublin City University in Ireland. Um, Saldad uh, has uh, worked in community radio in Ireland since she joined uh, near FM in 1997, where she is the radio coordinator since 2002. Uh, prior to leaving Spain, she was uh, involved in a radio project in Madrid for six years, and she has extensive experience in radio training, radio production, and project coordination. Uh, she's been a member of the board of AMARC since 2011 and was AMARC's uh, Europe president from 2013 to 2016. Uh, we have Rosemary Day. Uh, Dr. Rosemary Day is the head of the Department of Media and Communication Studies and senior lecturer at May Mary Immaculate College in, uh, at the University of Limerick in Ireland. Uh, she's the coordinating director of the Audio Research Centre and a member of the Regulatory Authority in Ireland, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, the BAI. Uh, she's a co-founder of three community radio stations, Radio Nalifa, an Irish language station, uh, Wired FM and Wired Limnick and is also a longtime researcher of and activist in community radio in Ireland globally uh, through her membership of AMARC Europe and CRAIL, Ireland's community radio forum. Uh, and uh, Vinod also mentioned, of course, uh, her landmark uh, books on the history uh, 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 of the community media sector uh, in Ireland. Uh, we have as well uh, Danny Lawrence, uh, a radio professional for 40 years, uh, awarded a British Empire Medal in 2013, um, and a British Citizen Award to Community Radio um, for his work uh, training young people from poor backgrounds and training in grassroots media. He's been chairman of the uh, Community Media Association. He's now in his second term and has been a council member for the last eight years. Uh, also runs a radio station in Essex and is chair of the Radio Hub Networking, groups, uh, networking Group. Um, and we have then uh, Janie Gordon, uh, a visiting research fellow at the University of Bedfordshire in the UK, uh, having uh, taught radio broadcasting in Bedfordshire and elsewhere. Uh, she has a background in professional radio and is also currently vice chair of the UK's Community Media Association, CMA. Uh, her research her publications and research areas interests are in the areas of community and small scale radio, mobile phones, new media and media pedagogy. And she's also the founder of Radio Lab 97.1, a uh, community radio station based at the University of Bedfordshire. And our final panelist who we'll be talking with uh, today is Terry Lee, a member of the University of Bedfordshire's uh, radio teaching team, also a member of staff responsible for uh, Radio Lab, uh, the, the station we uh, ju just mentioned in relation to, to Janie, uh, the, the university's community radio station. Uh, he supports a team of students who manage the output and activities of the radio station 
joined the university in 2014, uh, having previously been the manager of Future Radio in Norwich, where he had been working from 2007. And in 2018, he launched a podcast series called Fantastic Noise. Uh, the podcast is primarily aimed at students studying radio and features the voices of radio professionals uh, and experts. So as, as uh, those listening and uh, viewing this uh, can hear, we've, we've a wealth uh, of experience and, uh, and expertise uh, to draw on in today's conversation. Uh, we're going to start, uh, if we can, with uh, Steve. Um, Steve Buckley, as I mentioned, um, and the uh, founder of the uh, UK Community Media Association long-term uh, advocate uh, for uh, community media and community radio in the UK and internationally. Um, and I was wondering, Steve, if you would be able to uh, talk to us a little about uh, the state of, uh, of, of uh, I suppose, of civil society um, as, as we entered uh, this year. This year has been kind of t a tumultuous one uh, for community media, um, but what sort of what what was the health? What was the you know what, what how how did we enter the year? Was it a was were we in a healthy situation? What were the challenges we were seeing uh, as a sector? Andy, I'm back. Just to let you know. <laughs> oh hi, Salvo. Uh, so um, uh, yes, I was just uh, asking uh, Steve if 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 he's there um, about about the state of the. Uh, civil society um, and the state of the community media sector uh, as we as, you know as we came into 2020. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, let, let, let me just um, you know, start by by also thanking Vinod for organising um, this uh, series of events. Um, it, it's really lovely to be in the room with so many familiar faces, and old friends, and. Um, and to have the opportunity to, to share some of our experiences together through this um, extremely challenging period. Um, and let me also say, it's, um, I think it's uh, uh, really uh, appropriate that this initiative has come from, um, uh, from the Asian region, which has, where there's so much experience in our, in our sector of um, emergency and disaster response. Um, you know, having worked internationally in the sector for many years, um, um, including um, the privilege of working with AMARC. I've, um, I've learned so much about disaster response and emergency relief um, strategies um, from, uh, from particularly from the Asian region, from visits to um, Bihar and uh, Pakistan after floods, um, visits to uh, Indonesia, Aceh after the tsunami, um, and working with colleagues in Japan and, and Indonesia who responded to earthquake disasters. Uh, and, and for me, that was a really formative experience that helped um, us in our response here when we found ourselves in this public health emergency. Um, we have in the UK, I think, a very vibrant community radio sector that's grown up over the last um, particularly over the last 15 years when we achieved legislative change that we campaigned for for many, many years. Um, you know, I started off as a pirate broadcaster in the 1980s um, um, and we were being um, switched off so quickly after we switched on. Um, I think uh, it became about 10 minutes of freedom of expression um, campaign and then we would have to run away with our transmitter. But we decided campaigning for the legalization of community radio was a better route to, to get um, more diverse voices uh, on the air. And um, it took a very long time for us to, to translate that ambition um, to legislative change. But when we achieved that change, it rapidly brought a large number of community radio stations into play. And we're now over 250 across the UK. And they've demonstrated... Um, extraordinary resilience I and mean, compared to your average um, small enterprise community radio stations you know have proven that you know the vast majority of them have, have maintained uh, their, um, their their activities and their presence on air um, from launch to to date there's been very few actual failures and I think that in itself is is a measure of the strength of the sector um, so going into this um, you know community radio has become the local voice um, in, the, in the UK, the commercial radio sector is increasingly national and regional. Um, 
and, and there's, there's a very little local content. And in a, a context of a, a public health emergency like this, uh, local information, uh, actionable local information, holding local um, representatives to account, um, providing familiar local voices and so on, I think has been an absolutely vital part of the response and the, and the community broadcasting sector has played a really, really very important role. I'm sure we can say, you know, we're going to share a lot more about that and I'd love to share more about our experience with Sheffield Live in particular, but, but I would say that, you know, although the broader situation for civil society is, has been pretty challenging in this country over, over recent years. Um, the political environment's not, um, not been that conducive. We've, we've you know, faced economic challenges of, of years of austerity and so on. Um, but there is, a, I would say, a very vibrant grassroots civil society. And I would say that there's been a really uh, fascinating and important refresh of that over the last um, three months with... Um, the rapid rise um, when it became evident that we were in a crisis of uh, highly localized mutual aid groups um, uh, that have come together at street level, at neighborhood level, um, and at town and city level and in villages um, to help one another before um, you know, the uh, more um, structured um, public support um, came, came into play. And that's been one of the most uh, fascinating experiences of this. I think there's a renewed um, energy for uh, mutual aid and, and building social value at community and neighbourhood level, and I think that's probably one of the most important outcomes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, that notion of uh, I, I, that, that that phrase "mutual aid" seems to be uh, to uh, resonate uh, in, in many areas in terms of the the uh, as you say the local response that often has been uh, more effective or more more um, more uh, targeted than, than we sometimes see at a, at a national or, or prof professional level. Um, I'm going to pass over to, um, uh, to, 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 to Salvo to talk with, uh, with Sally for a few moments. We, we might have a chance or we will have a chance to come back uh, to Steve uh, later on. Uh, Salvo, do you want to uh, uh, yeah. jump in next? Yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks, Andy, and thanks, Steve, for uh, the first contribution. I think something important is, as we have doing here, this event has been you know, led from, from, from Asia and, and it's including colleagues, uh, practitioners, and researchers from all the world, is the fact that you know, this experience at the community media level have been networked from both you know, researchers and practitioners, and this network includes colleagues who have been uh, practitioners in the past and decided to become academics at a later stage and so on and so forth. Uh, which is quite important and uh, in this context and I guess how you know learning from those experiences elsewhere in Asia um people deciding to, to then prepare things uh, um, where, where we are. Uh, with Sally now I wanted to touch on um, I have a reflection on the role of community media uh, in a crisis situation like a, a, a pandemic and um, if possible study to uh, discuss a bit on the challenging of operating in, in, in such an environment, in this changing environment. Okay, so there are different challenges that uh, we have to face when um, uh, COVID-19 knock on, the, on our doors, okay? So, first of all, community radio, the way we operate and it's part of our ethos, is a physical space that is open for people to meet, to learn, to share, so we weren't really prepared for the possibility of having to basically leave the studios and the, and the office and try to produce uh, radio programs from a distance. Uh, so I suppose that that was the initial challenge. We were, although we tried to put together a kind of emergency plan in case that the lockdown will, be, will come to us, uh, we were still unprepared when it happens because it happens very suddenly. Um, so initially it was a bit chaotic. We didn't stop broadcasting at all in years, and I think most community radios in Ireland actually kept broadcasting. We were deemed an essential service media. Uh, so in fact, that meant that people could still uh, go to the studios and go to the office to work. In the case of Near FM, we decided uh, actually to uh, start working remotely, mostly because we wanted to protect our volunteers and uh, staff from, uh, from, from, from the virus, basically. 
um, as I said, we have a small office, we have three studios, we have 80 programs every week. There is a lot of programs that are produced by groups of volunteers or they are co-presented. We couldn't get guests into the studios either. It was too dangerous. So I think the first challenge was that to, to get people to start producing radio. So uh, very quickly, we bought uh, some equipment online and we used some equipment we already had and actually provide some of the volunteers and the staff with uh, some equipment and instructions so they could start producing remotely. And basically that's the number of volunteers then that also bought their own equipment to produce the radio program was kind of interesting. You could see that really there is a sense and a love of radio and a love of communication and really that was good to see. Uh, now we are on phase three in Ireland. Okay, so we are basically back in the studios. We started working as uh, teams, or uh, now the fancy word at the moment is pods. Okay, so we have pods of people. So four or five people are working together all the time, and it's always the same people. And we have started incorporating then volunteers, but they just come as presenters. So basically, the interaction between administration and studios is kind of uh, restricted very much. And you know, that's one of the challenges I think that we will have to face in the midterm, sure, a, mid a midterm, how to deal with something that is really important for community radio, that is accessibility and the, the system of that space to communicate and share and learn from each other. I think that's at the moment, that could be the main difficulty from a kind of ethical point of view. Obviously, there are other associated difficulties, okay? For example, funding. Uh, a lot of community radios depend on uh, public funding. So, so of that public funding is still coming. So that means that in some ways you can maintain staff. However, what about the running cost, okay? Uh, usually, community radios we do fundraisers such as pop quiz, such as uh, you know uh, fundraising nights. All this is out the window. So, how are you going to pay rent, electricity, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, okay. So, I know that the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland actually has now announced this week an, a special round of funding open only to community radios that will allow community radios actually to look for funding for the first time, okay, to deal with running costs and staff costs, okay, which is actually a huge change from the situation we were in the past. However, it just opened now and uh, probably the funding won't arrive till the autumn, so it puts more pressure on community radios actually to try to sustain themselves till that time and yeah. Mm. yeah and politically then it's also kind of the lack of understanding of politicians about the dif difference between community and community radios and local commercial radios again they don't uh, even you know community radio was licensed in 1995 in ireland and you can see that the politicians are still don't understand the difference between community radios and commercial radios. So that's a, total, a very difficult challenge because when there is a discussion about support, any kind of support, okay, uh, to sector, they always talk about commercial radios and they tend to forget community radios. So that's another challenge because I think that obviously the new environment is very challenging to all media in general but it's also challenging to community radio. And the fact that people can still, the people who are making decisions sometimes can, can still understand the specific needs of the sector is another difficulty we have to face. So I'm going to leave it there. Okay, I could talk, as they said, for Ireland here, but <laughs> I think it's enough for the moment. Yeah, thank you, Sally. And I think uh, you mentioned some very important points that, uh, let's say, unlike other type of radio stations, uh, the community development function that uh, community radio stations have means that usually there is a lot of buzz uh, 
in the station itself is a place where people meet, where people does projects. Actually, for some uh, community members, is a safe space from an unsafe space they might have at home for some particular communities. And the fact that uh, you know COVID nineteen brought all this, the restrictions can you know prove very very difficult for you to do. Uh, it's important, I guess, of course, uh, dealing an essential service um, like after custom services. But again, you also pointed out that the challenges. Some of them are all challenges to say, you know, community radio is different than local uh, commercial radio, um, uh, which, you know, are even more important is now. And I guess pointing out also when everything else seems to be urgent for the government or the local government um, and the, the, the restrictions on funding to even be able to shout more effectively, look, you know, this situation is bringing us to a more difficult thing. Um, uh, also in the context, uh, in the UK, at least there have been a couple of groups, I think, uh, that actually had announced a cutting to the regional and, and local services. So basically, you will get more pre recorded stuff from London, uh, even if the station nominally had a license for a particular region of the UK, which again brings back the question how local is the service and how more important even community radio remains in those 250 uh, plus communities as well. And I guess the last thing also about funding. Um, you know, festivals, radio marathons, and pub quizzes have been all passed off the budget of the, sorry, the bouquet of events, of physical events at home, how are going to do that, and how your current challenges will be bound by the fact that the broadcasting part of Ireland will make it this funding, which is important, it's good, this is a knowledge, but in the autumn, and we have still probably three, four months away from that. So, and then I'll pass back to Andrew for the next speaker. Uh, thanks, Aldo, and, and thanks, Sally, and uh, as, as Salva noted, some some very good, so, so some very core points there. Uh, I want to pick up on um, uh, something Sally mentioned uh, relating to uh, support from the the regulator and the the understanding of the political uh, class, I suppose, or the political system uh, of the community sector. Uh, and uh, uh, Rosemary Day, Doctor Day, who we have uh, with us. Um, uh, has 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 been both sides of the fence uh, as a as a long term um, practitioner and 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 uh, uh, innovator in in community media, but also uh, more recently as a member of our regulatory uh, body here, and so so has kind of uh, a sense of 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 the broader broader regulatory picture. I think um, in in Ireland that that's useful. Uh, what do you think? Of that notion that um, that Sally mentioned that uh, that uh, uh, politicians and perhaps also sometimes uh, regulators um, don't, I suppose, don't have a full understanding of uh, of the particularities of of community media and uh, what do you know what what do you see as the prospects for um, for support or for uh, for how the regulatory system in Ireland uh, is likely to respond. Uh, as we go forward. Okay, Rosemary? so thanks. First, I'd like to repeat what everybody else has said. It's great to have this discussion ongoing, particularly in the current uh, climate and, 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 and pandemic. Uh, and my thanks to Vinod and to the whole team at UNESCO to, to, um, for convening the series of, of talks. I think it's interesting to know what's happening globally. Um, the situation in Ireland, and I suppose to an extent in the UK, is always different. As Steve said earlier, we haven't the same experience, uh, we've been fortunate, of um, major crises as other parts of the world. But um, I think we can learn lessons from them. Um, I'd also like to clarify that my tenure on the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland came to an end in February, but because we didn't have a government uh, in place until last week, uh, new members haven't been appointed, so just officially uh, I'm no longer a member. But I served five very happy years um, on the authority, having spent 25 to 30 years prior to that, um, knocking on the door and looking for um, uh, better regulation, looking first originally for licensing, as Steve described in the UK, it wasn't that different here in Ireland. Uh, we went through a long period from um, 1988, uh, when um, independent broadcasting was first licensed, uh, when the monopoly of our public state broadcaster was, was, was uh, removed. 
we went through a long period of looking to, um, to get stations on air. We succeeded with the first two stations in 1993, uh, Reginald and Liffa, which is for Irish speakers in Dublin, and what's now become Dublin City FM, which is um, very closely linked to the um, local authority in Dublin for traffic uh, regulation. And then the more commonly understood versions of community radio, and I suppose the ones that we all hold dear, and um, the ones that are based in their um, locality, um, that serve their, their geographic community in particular, although also communities of interest, these started to be licensed in 1995 in Ireland. And, um, you know, they, they weren't um, immediately successful. Uh, the biggest problems um, were uh, financial, how to fund the stations, and as Sally alluded to there, for near and for all stations in Ireland, that's still a problem. So before, uh, when I was preparing for this session, I made contact with the coordinator of CRAIL. CRAIL is um, Ireland's community radio forum, if you like. It's an association of community radio stations um, which uh, supports the development of um, uh, new stations and in particular supports the existing stations in terms of advice, training, governance, etc. So Mary's um, observations, Mary Lennon, uh, were, were really um, interesting and echo uh, or show that what Sally had to say about near is true throughout the country. And um, the financial impact of COVID-19 is probably one of the biggest um, challenges. Uh, stations generally, there were 21 stations on air at the, at the beginning of the lockdown. 17 of these um, responded to her survey. And um, most of them were coping quite well. They were pleased with their, um, how innovative and how technologically able um, their volunteers were. So after, as Sally said, buying things like um, uh, clean feed, uh, the different software that they needed, a little um, uh, recorders to go on the edge of people's phones, etc. Uh, stations found that they could quite successfully manage to keep uh, programmes on air, particularly um, with, sorry for the light, I've put down my blinds, particularly with the um, addition of, um, or with the repeating of, 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 of previously popular programmes. The loss of sport, obviously, when all sport closed down, was very difficult for most stations in terms of providing live programming. And uh, the difficulty of continuing to have a diverse range of voices was difficult. Many of the stations in Ireland um, depend on older people as volunteers and, and, um, and broadcast to older people. And in Ireland, um, people over 70 were asked to cocoon, was the phrase we used, which is quite nice, uh, but to stay at home and uh, nest and keep safe, keep away from everyone. So that was difficult for stations in terms of broadcasting when, when many of their volunteers were older, but it was particularly um, worrying for stations in terms of how to make contact with and keep their volunteers supported. So not just going on air for the general community, but also keeping that uh, connection. So several stations um, spent, uh, used their staff to make phone calls on a regular basis just to their volunteers. Some stations would have to up to 150 volunteers uh, who'd be on air on a regular basis, and that was important. Um, only one station has come off air, and that was a station which hasn't got a full license. It was uh, Balana, um, which it was trying to, 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 to get on air, but the others have all succeeded. And um, there's been a, an interesting um, range of reactions. Some stations reduced their um, programming um, hours, but others um, up to, to 24-7. So I know near stayed on air, Sally, that's correct, isn't it, for 24 hours um, a day, seven days a week. And the student station Flirt, which Andrew founded um, in Galway, um, up to its hours. And um, the station manager there, Paul McGee, was particularly concerned about 2,000 students who had accommodation in um, the city for the duration of the term and who didn't go home when um, the country went into lockdown. So who were living in student accommodation, which is usually pretty difficult and grim, and who needed um, a con connections with others, and particularly for that younger age group. So both the older age group and the younger um, sort of late teens, early 20s, uh, age group, we see um, community radio stations now, and particularly focusing on them. So to come back to your question, eventually, Andrew, you asked about how the regulator in Ireland has been supporting community radio, and um, the the new scheme uh, announced just this week by um, the BAI uh, should be of help. But of course, that won't kick in for a while. Traditionally, um, the regulator um, has been very supportive of the sector, 
And I know from my own time as station manager and as volunteer with um, uh, our student station in Limerick, Wired FM, we always found that the regulator was more like a, a facilitator and um, a port that we could call on um, for help when we needed it. Until recently, that help hasn't really been significantly financial. Um, up until this week, the, the, the main source of funding coming through or challenged through the regulator has been through a scheme called Sound and Vision, which is for the making of public service type programming, which can be aired on any channel. And that's been useful. However, the um, network that we call CRAIL, which is the Irish word for to broadcast, um, that was actually started as an initiative of the regulator. And so when we had the first stations coming on air in 1995 as a pilot scheme, the um, regulator uh, put a, or hired a, a full-time person uh, to look at, to monitor certainly the um, progress and the success or failure of the early stations, but also to um, set up a network. And that has proved invaluable to stations. Um, initially, it was um, very concerned, as I said, with finances, and uh, then over the years, it has developed to provide essential training and networking. Um, so the, I draw everybody globally your attention to the CRAIL website, that's C-R-A-O-L dot I-E, where the um, findings, a summary of the findings of the survey the COVID-19, how are stations coping survey, those were available there. It's only two pages long. The entire survey is available if you want it, but um, it gives some really interesting pointers as to how stations in Ireland are coping. And the work of CRAIL is funded um, by uh, the regulators. So the coordinator, Mary Lennon, her uh, project coordination uh, job is funded on a three-year uh, basis by the regulator. And there's also one part-time position which is funded and I think it's interesting that this position is for a person to um, work on governance and um, uh, correct procedures for stations. Because one of the things I noted um, as a, a member of the authority in Ireland and also as a member of the um, compliance committee um, was that, that the most difficult uh, stations with the greatest difficulties were ones with the least good um, governance. Um, and sometimes stations, particularly those who are in, in trouble, will complain that you know, there's too many regulations and it's too difficult to manage. And when you dig deeper into those, often there are stations that might complain about, well, it's too hard to get women on boards. Well, that's a regulation. They have to have 50% gender balance. And um, you know, oh, it's too hard to get people to serve on committees. Or, um, well, we don't want to rotate the chairperson because we have a very good person and uh, you know, that will do fine. So I've, I've certainly, it, it, it's not that it's this black and white, but generally stations that are in, in big trouble, they haven't set up um, their uh, infrastructure with its roots in the community. And um, often when um, this person goes to help with governance and meets resistance, um, Gradually, the, 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 the group that are foundering will um, begin to see that, yes, if you do set up the proper subcommittees, if you do have proper um, lines of, um, of uh, responsibility, I suppose, that reach back into the community, if you're there for supported by the community, that your station will survive. And we've had at least four stations in the last six years which were in um, danger of closing, um, even though they've been on air for nearly, some of them for nearly 20 years, um, because they had run out of um, uh, community support, basically. And once they looked back at the first principles of what they should be doing in terms of serving their community and enabling that um, service to be recognised in the community, those things changed. And uh, those stations are on very good footings now, quite radically so. Um, so was there something else you asked me there, Andrew? No, I, th I think that's, uh, that's, that's really, uh, really uh, helpful. Uh, and, and I think that, that final point around uh, governance, uh, I found, I found uh, interesting because it, it can be easy sometimes for us to look elsewhere. You know, you know how, how, are, how are the politicians failing us? How are, um, you know, how is financing, cons finance constraining what we can do? But, uh, but very often governance is, is something that we, we have control of ourselves inside the sector. And sorry, the, the biggest thing I meant to say there and forgot, yeah. Uh, yeah. which they 
the, the project coordinator of CRAIL, of the Irish Community Radio Station, said to me was the biggest and most affirming finding uh, for each individual station and for the network as a whole was the reaffirmation of the core principle of serving the community. Because so often when we're chasing funding or we're going on the day-to-day -day management of stations, it might sound bizarre, but we can be removed from our community. Whereas with the epidemic, with this huge challenge, with the lockdown, with trying to cater for people, first keep them safe, and secondly then keep them mentally um, uh, engaged and connected. That social thing that Sally talked about, when you no longer have the physical locus of the station to come into, keeping those relationships going were um, the core of what community radio stations saw themselves doing. And the majority in their responses to the survey um, said that that was uh, the biggest positive that came out of the whole uh, lockdown experience. Okay, yeah. and, and again, so it's, it's back to that notion of, of mutual aid, as, as, as Steve had noted, as, as you say, Sally's notion of, 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 of physically drawing the station together, or the community together. How do you do, do that when you lack the physical infrastructure, but still have that at your core. I was going to mention in, in relation to um, uh, governance, I know uh, one of our colleagues at Minute, uh, Anne O'Brien, has done good work on, uh, on uh, the role of boards and the role, role of governance in community media. So, so people may be interested in checking out her work. I'll pass back to uh, Salvo, who will move on to, I think, uh, to Danny next. Yeah, I do. I do. And thanks for now for passing the crowd uh, link over here. And I was just looking over there that uh, in Ireland you had National Community Radio Day uh, a couple of weeks ago, 19th of June. Mm -hmm. Great, I guess, moment to celebrate the work you do. And uh, it, it, that included the news item, the publication of a report from Broadcasting about the, about the violence of a report highlighting uh, the social benefits, which is, as you're saying, and very, very key, especially this period where there's a lot of great work actually going on. Um, so uh, Rosemary was touching on experience with the regulator and then having the kind of um, uh, the, 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 uh, experience um, over there. So when moving on to uh, the UK, Danny, uh, and welcome to you again, um, how is currently your experience dealing with, with Ofcom? I know, I mean, there's been a quite, um, uh, constructive relationship in the past. Uh, one of the colleagues, I guess, is not here today, is on a paternity leave. Uh, Laurie Hallett did uh, jump from being a pirate broadcaster to be um, to be then part of Ofcom, uh, be a consultant and now an academic uh, as well. And uh, uh, in your case, uh, do you think, and what's your relationship back in the UK with Ofcom right now? And do you think there is a need also for reform and transformation within the sector after this post sort of uh, pandemic world? Um, so, um, okay, thank you very much. Well. Yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, well, it's been an interesting time uh, running a station uh, uh, at the moment um, with um, remote working, and it's been really interesting to see um, how the UK practitioners and people around the world have managed to do remote working from home, um, studio broadcasting, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really been pleasing to see how people have learned from others. Um, and of course, um, nearly 300 community radio stations on air in the UK, um, each with their own challenges. Um, so regarding uh, Ofcom, um, the Community Media Association um, has um, regular quarterly meetings uh, with Ofcom, and we're pleased to say uh, that those meetings have continued um, during the pandemic, um, like we are today on Zoom, uh, those meetings have taken place. Um, and when the pandemic first started, we were very much aware that we have a community radio fund, uh, which is managed by Ofcom on behalf of the uh, DCMS. And um, so we were very much aware that stations were um, losing funding as far as um, advertising revenue goes um, and also from uh, a lot of stations like mine do education uh, so the education side of students coming in uh, stopped and so suddenly there was this you know big fear of uh, funding um, stopping um, and um, 
we've been very fortunate with um, grant funders uh, who have all signed up to um, a national MOU um, where existing grant holders who were worried about their grants um, are still getting their grants um, and a lot of the applications for grant funding has now um, been wrapped around COVID-19 and trying to help your community business um, get over the hurdles that you may face uh, with different ways of um, working and so a lot of these grant funders have been putting in six months uh, grant applications to try and help groups. So our Ofcom meetings have been continuing and our very first meeting that we had recently um, was regarding the Community Radio Fund um, and how we felt that, um, you know, trying to get money from the government at this time when everyone else is trying to get money during the COVID-19 pandemic, that the 400,000 that they normally split into two rounds in previous years could be used as an emergency fund to help uh, community radio broadcasters um, get on and, and, you know, and, and capture their business um, and help them. Um, obviously, 400,000 is not a lot of money, and we were concerned that this is not new money that, that was being used. This is old money that we always get. But I was very much concerned that, you know, that 400,000 could be ring fenced for something else. Um, and so therefore we said that we'd like to, you know, have an emergency fund to, to be able to help those stations. Um, Ofcom received over 200 applications for grant funding. Uh, there was some money left over and we had a meeting last week um, to, um, uh, for them to uh, get rid of the rest of the money that was, that's there in the pot. So they're actually inviting another round uh, at, towards the end of, the, uh, end of this month uh, for stations um, who weren't successful or may need um, uh, tweaking their applications uh, for them to try and apply for some funding. And some of the funds, we haven't actually advertised which stations got the funds because we're very much aware that it should be on a, uh, normally they say they do a breakdown of the stations, but we were very much aware that, you know, not every station wants their business um, publicised um, uh, that they're in trouble or that you know they really need help um, but it just showed us from the capture of the 200 applications or I think it was 202 applications that what kind of um, state the community radio sector is in and also going forward um, with the DCMS we're asking Ofcom to capture some of that information in the applications to be able to provide a direct link into, into the DCMS to use that as a leverage to government to try and get more funding uh, for community radio uh, by, by using that, that evidence that we will clearly, we will clearly have. Um, so our meetings with Ofcom um, have always been uh, good. They, they're always there at the end of an email if we, um, if we need be. Um, and our quarterly meeting that we had only a couple of weeks ago uh, we also take um, concerns of, of um, CMA members uh, to them uh, as well to get some some clarification, that kind of thing. So our our, our relationship with with, with Ofcom is is um, stronger than ever, I would say, um, and also the DCMS who who like to involve the CMA um, in what their thinking is um, and give some guidance to some of their future ideas uh, but at the moment you know when I tuned into the dialogues last week Australia and the one the week before um, it's I, I was interested to see that we've all got the same problem in one way or another but in a different, it's a bit like running the community radio station you know you you all have the same sort of issues but in a different way and it was pleasing to see uh, how other countries are dealing um, with this um, this uh, this this pandemic, um, but I would say that community radio in this country is as stronger as ever. Uh, at the moment, obviously, with people working from home, you do have that problem with um, volunteers um, not coming into the station. Um, I'm lucky to be in a shopping centre, um, and we were we weren't closed during the pandemic, but we had less people coming in naturally and more remote working. And other stations have have worked it in in different ways um, 
to the way that they, they operate, uh, which is great. Uh, and I really like the fact that there's real strict, uh, real good social gain uh, and grassroots uh, radio from the communities that are taking part. Um, 40% increase in listeners to my station. So more people are listening because they're, they were at home or, and they're more li- interested in, in, in finding out what's going on in their local, local community. Um, so it's interesting, it's interesting, uh, interesting times um, around the country to see what's going to be happening. Now, Ofcom have um, uh, started up uh, restricted service licenses for COVID-19. Um, and those licenses were initially for areas that never had community stations or would like to just focus on the pandemic. Um, and normally, um, as Steve would know, you used to get 28 days and then you wouldn't be able to go on again for about four, four months or so. You could only do two a year. But some of those um, RSLs have been extended uh, to the middle of this month. And I, I've asked Ofcom, uh, who are going to be making an announcement next Monday, um, about um, restricted service licenses uh, and broadcasting during the pandemic. If there are local lockdowns, um, like there is going to be in Leicester here in the UK, uh, will they be allowing those short broadcasters to be able to continue uh, the service that they're already running uh, past uh, the 15th of July when the rest of them are due to come off? So there's an announcement uh, due um, next week. Um, we try and keep in touch with all the members. We have a chairman's letter that goes out every week uh, to all our members of the CMA to try and um, tell them where, where there's funding opportunities, uh, where there's um, grants uh, available from uh, local government, like uh, rates relief and, uh, and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and basically, we're trying to embrace and keep more in touch with everybody uh, to find out you know, how they're coping, that kind of thing. So. It's been a busy time um, in community radio. Well, on that, on that note, thank, thank you, Danny. And I think you're pointing out a number of things. Um, just for those who may be unfamiliar, the DCMS is the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, which is um, yeah. the branch of government, of the UK government, that deals yeah. with, uh, uh, with media-related matters. And uh, you're pointing out to the RSLs, so the Strictly Service Licenses, uh, I'm not sure how many of the, the colleagues uh, and the listeners here are familiar with that, but again, in the UK, you could apply for a license for up to 28 days. Uh, in the early days, many community radio stations do that. Um, and uh, usually, we'll be able to do this only once a year, but uh, as Danny pointed out, the COVID-19 situation seemed to have put an increase in importance on that, and in some areas, there may be capacity to do a community radio for a short period of time rather than having a plan for you know for many years uh and it's important to see what's what's happened what happened and what's going on going on there so that's be something to have a look uh important you pointed out a strong sector which is good to hear and um and and to the social gain and 40 percent of increase of listeners that's you know great news to be shared among the sector i guess that's going to be shouted out uh, if you get more more data from the rest of the UK to the government, uh, also in the context of what I was saying before, that some commercial radio groups have actually cut the local involvement, if there was any local involvement at all, or even if having a pre-recorded message from a DJ means any any local you know, relevant stuff. So it's really, really important. And I see also really positive that that um, dialogue with Ofcom, which has ever been quite strong, keeps having there and that they they... Um, important that they adapt to the circumstances, as also uh, and, and Rosemary was mentioning before, line is quite important. And I want also, on a last note, the importance I can thank Vinod and the team uh, for this global dialogues, because then you know the chairs of national associations, practitioners, and academic can see and share great experiences in this place. So probably one of the good things about this pandemic, maybe sometimes would have done these events in person and, you know, uh, not everybody can travel to the other end of the world to hear how wonderful, you know, community radio is in Colombia or uh, in Africa or in Asia. But, uh, you know, thanks Benoit, again for putting all, all this together, which is really, really useful. Uh, on that note, I'll pass back to Andrew for the next speaker. Okay, and th- thanks, Alba. And that's a, a, a good point, I think, um, that this is a challenging moment uh, for 
us for for, for everybody, but for uh, for community media, as we we talked about the challenge of of not having the physical spaces we usually do, but there are also uh, opportunities for for you know um, to be relevant, to be of service to our community, and to to that to that role, um, and that's something that I think. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Janie Gordon, uh, will be able to uh, to to speak to perhaps uh, Janie. You've uh, been both a, an, an academic. You've you've uh, you 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 research uh, community media and technology. Um, you you you're involved in uh, in uh, uh, the Radio Lab um, service, and 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 also you've been involved in the in the sector and with the CMA. And um, what do you see? Uh, what do you think about that notion that there's both possibilities and challenges at the same moment for, for the sector now? Uh, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, yes, I think absolutely. And, and I suppose um, I, I fully accept the points that the other speakers have made. I mean, finance always comes up with community radio. There's, there's never enough money. But that's how community radio functions. Uh, I, I mean, in a way, if it was unlimited funds, it possibly wouldn't have the edginess that it does. Um, I'm most concerned about the uh, the technologies involved, to be honest. Um, and in particular, I feel that the pandemic has really forced civil society online. I mean, here we are on a Zoom meeting being watched by the Facebook groups and so on around the world. This will be uploaded, people will watch it later. We have become increasingly online. People are working online. They are using um, online services to, to talk to family and friends um, and, and they're getting their entertainment online. Oh, indeed, and shopping online. Rarely a, a day goes past without a delivery from um, uh, one of the, the, the companies who are providing online shopping services. So people have gone onto, onto online and to digital. Um, and this has come up um, as on behalf of the CMA. I've been sitting on a, a digital listener group, which has been... Um, was, was set up by the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport in the UK. And it has been looking at how listeners listen. Now, this is not just um, in community radio. This is for all radio. But, but we're talking about serving our community. And the way that radio broadcasters serve their community is by broadcasting. And, and the people who are interacting are our listeners. Now, Pardon me, Steve, I know, I know that you have a television service as well, but obviously it's terribly important that our broadcasts are good. Now, what's happened in recent uh, years and very recently and increasingly during the pandemic is that people are using digital services to um, access their media. And so in particular, they are using um, online stations, online services, uh, downloading podcasts, uh, for example, I'm sorry, Terry, I'll, uh, Terry and his daughter have been doing a, a wonderful podcast, which is which is online. Um, but also uh, just just accessing different stations, and that I'm sure has helped the community stations. They've been found by their local communities, people who didn't really know they were there, but then suddenly they found their community station and they found them online. Now, along with that, um, there is a there are these multitude of platforms as well as online. There is, of course, the FM services, the AM services, the analog services, and the digital services, the DAB, DAB Plus, and in the UK, just coming up, these small scale digital, uh, digital audio broadcasts. So what's happening is we've got this multi-platform um, broadcasting environment and I think it is important that community radio does not get left behind. We could easily find ourselves in an analog cul-de-sac unless we make sure that we are going forward with the digital as well. So I think that is a challenge coming through. I think that our audiences, our listeners, our communities expect us to be proper broadcasters and to use the digital services. Um, as well as the analog uh, services. I think that's where the uh, community broadcasters are going to have to go. Now, in fact, um, the small scale uh, DAB 
um, multiplex licenses are being advertised at the moment and obviously there is quite a there's quite an appetite to make sure that community radio is reflected in those um, in those multiplexes and indeed the broadcasters on those multiplexes once they once they actually get going um, in, in the UK we had a um, small-scale DAB trial um, with a number of community radio stations who were both multiplex um, holders um, and also uh, multiplex broadcasters. Um, Future Radio in Norwich, um, Resonance in London, uh, Angel Radio down on the south coast. It, these are services which, which, were, which were very successful as um, digital uh, small-scale digital uh, um, broadcasters to their local area. So I think that's somewhere that the community sector have to be to be looking at. I think they also have to be looking at at going um, onto these multi-platforms. They're providing a good service online. Increasingly, listeners are going to be using their voice-activated assistants, um, Alexa, for example. Um, and they're going to want to say, Alexa, find my local community station um, and, and name it. So that's, we're, we're having to work that way. Um, we want uh, the community broadcasters, uh, their listeners will expect to be able to listen to their favourite local um, walking group who walks the local hills and broadcasts once a week. That's fantastic. But if they're not there when that's being broadcast, they will want to listen again service. And that's common. That's common. People download onto their phones and then listen in their car later or listen while they're cooking or whatever. And that's commonplace. And so community broadcasters need to be looking at these ordinary bits of technology, which the commercial services and the public service broadcasters are using and and our listeners will expect to have as well now the problem with that is of course it'll cost money and we go back to finance um, so actually financing this multi-platform world is something that community broadcasters are going to have to be to be looking at and though i suspect they're going to have to look at the ways that uh, commercial services um, also uh, broadcast now it's interesting because um, the digital group which I was on was was looking at um, how people were growing up and listening. So, um, for example, Terry and I, I hope I'm not preempting you, but uh, but Terry's daughter, who is seven years old, is quite used to the idea of a pod podcast. Now she's going to be able to take that forwards into her teenage years and into her adult years. Uh, podcasting is becoming increasingly normal. Um, listening on a mobile phone uh, is streaming is becoming increasingly normal. We've, we've got to be thinking ahead. We've got to be thinking where we want to go with this if we're going to survive and not be in a cul-de-sac. We do need to be looking at small-scale DAB. It's a very good transmission system. It does risk becoming a kind of Betamax of, uh, of transmission systems if we don't take that forward and, and, and ex expand it and use it. I think that's, that's terribly important. So um, in terms of, uh, as I said, I don't wish to re repeat what other people have said, but I think that the technology of how we do our job as community broadcasters is a really key point. And I think that civil society has changed the way it's using technology during the pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Janie. I think uh, that uh, one of the things I know that often comes up in discussions about uh, about and among community media practitioners is uh, is the extent to which we we center uh, media as opposed to other aspects of our role. To what extent are we, you know, community development organizations that happen to use media? To what extent uh, are we? media organizations that do community development um, but either way i think your 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 point that um that if we want to if we want to do uh community service if we want to engage in community development we we need to, we need to make sure we're making effective use in this changing environment where where how people are using media changes and so therefore um that notion of of, of it, it's a moving target or for those of us working uh, in the sector and, and, and for practitioners making, uh, making media. I'll pass over to, uh, to, um, uh, to Salvo for our final uh, speaker, uh, if I can. Uh, Salvo? 
Yes, yes, Andrew. So, well, um, Jenny gave us an appetite for letting us know what Terry and his daughter are doing. So I guess probably you can tell us a bit about that in a moment, Terry. But we wanted to follow up also on, 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 um, on what the other speakers said um, and how, in your case, as, as Radio Lab, you know, responded to, to this pandemic and how you could stay relevant. I think uh, Jenny gave some few pointers there. So uh, let's hear from what's happening in Radio Lab and other experience you're aware of in the area. Thank you, Salva. Thank you, everyone. It's uh, really good to be here. And uh, yeah, Primrose, my daughter, will be delighted with the number of mentions she's uh, already got today. Uh, so she'll have to watch this back. I was going to say a few things. I'll talk about Radio Lab, but I can also talk about some other um, community radio stations that I've uh, got close relationships with and, and some of the things they're doing. Uh, ultimately, general point, UK community radio, I think it's fair to say, on the whole, has found a way to adapt positively uh, to the pandemic. Uh, and, and there's lots of various examples of this. Uh, we could talk about, for example, how uh, people have learnt how to use a USB microphone uh, and uh, Audacity free editing software and created a program or even uh, somehow done voice tracking using some remote software. Uh, things like that, which they hadn't done before. I've got volunteers, a uh, volunteer in his 70s who is now doing this, who can do it now. Uh, he didn't think he could, but now he can. And there are also new strands of community programming coming up around the UK. Uh, and some of them like focus on advice and highlighting online activities uh, that people can take part in during the pandemic. And it's, it's a really good cause. People are working from home. Uh, for their stations, volunteering from home, and now they know they can do it. Uh, we've also, and this is something Radio Lab's been doing, uh, Community Radio has been able to broadcast the voices of those in isolation. I think listeners are, and uh, people might disagree with me, but I think listeners are forgiving now of sound quality issues that come with people using their mobile phones as a way of sending audio. Um, and and so as a result, I'm hearing lots more voices of people, even recordings of people uh, sending sending their audio into radio stations, including the one that I uh, look after. I've even spoken to some community radio stations, so Summer Valley in the in the west of England, uh, that are increasing or have increased the amount of local programming that they've put out during this pandemic, and that's kind of incredible, really, when you come to think of the limitations of accessing the studios and, and things like that so so there's a lot of good that's coming out of this on top of the points uh, that many that Janie just raised about using zoom and everyone suddenly you know knowing how zoom works and knowing to mute their microphones at the right times and stuff like that that's pretty cool uk community radio has though had its fair share of suffering in this time uh, and one example um, is my previous radio station, Future Radio in Norwich. Their landlord uh, for their studio uh, site went into liquidation. Um, and as a result, they got dehomed, uh, which, which is a nightmare. Um, they have temporarily moved back into um, a previous studio based in the charity building on the other side of the city of Norwich, but they are now desperately trying to find a way of finding a, a new home and a new place uh, in the center of Norwich where they can be broadcasting again. Uh, but obviously there are lots of examples of stations losing all their, or almost all their advertising. Uh, education's already come up in conversation today. Uh, obviously with Radio Lab, we rely on students quite a lot and they all of a sudden weren't able to access Radio Lab and many of them uh, almost disappeared off our radar because you can't physically see them and, and it's hard to make everyone carry on doing things as normal online. So, uh, so community radio has had uh, problems that it's had to, uh, had to overcome. Now, uh, a point that's been raised, and, 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 and I'm going to try and follow up without repeating too many of the things that have come up, but how UK community radio is using the pandemic uh, as a way of reinforcing its uh, importance and the local uh, impact that it gives. Uh, Salvo's talked about the how commercial radio stations, um, there, there's been, I guess, a lot of brands, national brands taking over local commercial stations. That's only increasing. 
Um, and, and I think it, there's opportunities and that's what the community radio sector in the UK is generally uh, thinking. There's an opportunity for us to, to reinforce our, our localness and it can be through on-air stuff like uh, my friends at Wickham Sound, they've given away something like £30,000 worth of on-air advertising time to local uh, businesses and, and, and groups. But there's also uh, our neighbours, where we're based, Radio Labs, based in Luton, our neighbours, Diverse FM, have been delivering meals throughout the pandemic, like hundreds of meals to people across Luton, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, I, I know as well that there's been giving away of, of radios. Um, uh, I think that's a CMA initiative or something that Danny uh, Lawrence did, Danny, who we heard from already today. So community radio is finding a way of, of, of being active and, and, and carrying on good work in, in slightly different ways. Um, some, some points, I think, oh, I, I did want to raise as well, sorry, checking my notes like the radio person I am. Um, I did want to, to raise another thing that local community radio stations are doing well. Uh, tomorrow, for example, on our station, Radio Lab, uh, we will be broadcasting a program, a special program for the High Town Festival that would have been taking place tomorrow in Luton. Uh, they've created some audio uh, with one of our former students getting involved in that and we'll be broadcasting that at midday. Likewise, down the road in St Albans, Radio Verulam, I've, I've got an e-flower show, which is a, a big promotional event, which I mean, I'm fascinated to find out more about that. Uh, in Norwich, the North Norwich Festival has used the radio station to, to help with the fact that they couldn't do their normal huge amount of events. Um, and and you've, a few of you have already mentioned pub quizzes. I've heard that come up a lot, which is a great idea of in, involving the community. And, and let's not forget, not everyone has got an uh, online connection to do a Zoom pub quiz with, or, or even a group of friends to do a Zoom pub quiz with. So a uh, pub quiz on the radio is a, is a brilliant way of, of involving the local community. Um, going forward, uh, how, can, how can UK community radio stay relevant? And, and Janie's, Janie's mentioned uh, a lot of things about smart speakers and podcasting. And, and I've heard as well about stats to do with listeners going up. And, and I think online stats have improved. I think that's partly because uh, people who listen to their radio in their car, like me normally, have been doing less of that because I've not been in my car anywhere near as often. Uh, and, and so online uh, listening has gone up. And I am one of those people that is doing a lot more online listening with my smart speaker. Uh, something which I have listened to and, and uh, considered with interest is how BBC News on the smart speaker, you can get an interactive uh, news uh, bulletin, if you like, where it will ask you every now and again if you want to hear more about a particular story or you can go to the next story and things like that, which is innovative and interesting. I, I think that launched right at the start of, of this pandemic season, uh, if you like. And, and that sort of on, on, well, interactive and on-demand uh, listening is something UK community radio is going to have to consider. And, and one obvious way of doing it, and Janie highlighted this, is by looking at what's going on in podcasting and trying to, I guess, think about how certain programs can have uh, their content that maybe take the music away because of rights issues, but, but still have the other content, make a podcastable form. Uh, it's not impossible. RSS technology is out there uh, and, and there will be ways in which uh, the sector can, can really take hold of that. Um, in a conversation I had last year, with um, someone at BBC Radio 4 uh, from their Beyond Today podcast, I asked them about why this Beyond Today programme, which has won awards for, for covering in-depth news stories every day, why it was a podcast and not a radio programme, to which the reply was, oh, but it does go out on the radio as well, occasionally, when Radio 4 needs to, to fill time. And we, we've talked about how... Uh, Primrose and, and I, the podcast that we've been making uh, has been something that's been going on in the pandemic as a way of, I guess, helping to, to help Primrose's communication skills and interviewing skills and things like that, which has been great fun. Uh, but that content can also go out on a radio station. It's completely broadcastable uh, as well. 
and and I think that's something which which can be considered by community radio stations as well how podcast content can be turned to radio or likewise a lot of BBC programs that are on the radio turn into podcasts uh, the two can complement each other nicely and I think that's something the sector needs to to embrace more yeah thank you and thank you again to shedding you know all the creativity we've gone around the community radio stations you're aware of um, I wonder if any commercial radio station would give away thirty thousand pounds of advertising space to their community. Um, I don't want to say they didn't, but I, I'm not aware uh, of that. But this is, that's a great thing. And I say how uh, stations have been able to reinvent um, themselves and and stay local. You know, you can have physical you know, delivery of food, or for actual, as you were citing something that might have been done on. Um, uh, delivering actual, you know, receivers, which uh, is as important, but also the challenges. As you say, you know, Future Radio has done nothing, uh, you know, bad themselves or any financially, you know, problematic decision. But then the landlord ends up in trouble, and then you know, I don't know how many stations may have uh, uh, similar things. So it's quite important, um, you know, to point out all those things. That's really, um, really key. Uh, I also think that you were pointing out to the fact that I think the level of sound quality, uh, I think if, you know, listeners got away with the fact that even the BBC have, might have, you know, lower than normal standard, you know, quality on, on national or global television, then uh, everybody, I guess, is a bit more prone to say, well, you know, it, it's fine to have this kind of connection. So thank you again for being uh, uh, guys, us. Um, the uh, some of the great experience on the ground there's plenty of it in the meantime while you were talking uh you know there are so many inputs for exciting research projects or stuff that could done and there are some funds in the uk uh and i guess elsewhere also about uh covid19 related research so probably this is something for you know after this 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 uh this event to think uh how we can also support the sector to have research which brings all this fantastic news out and helps to, to do so. Uh, back to Andre. I'm sorry, I, did, uh, I didn't quite catch, uh, catch the last one. No, I, I was there. just saying back to you, I guess, for the next uh, phase. Perfect. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and uh, thank you, Salvo. And uh, thank you to all our, uh, our panelists. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to open this up uh, for a broader conversation. I'm going uh, to pass you. It back. Yes. Hold on. I think Danny wanted to add something before we go to that. Is that oh, correct? Sure, certainly, Danny? yeah. Yeah, I was just going to mention uh, just to what Terry was talking about regarding stations um, doing things for their community. Um, he, he touched on my project, which I've been running at my station. Uh, we started off giving isolated, vulnerable people free radios, um, and they had to be nominated. Um, and then it progressed uh, into uh, Age UK being involved in the project. And I'm very pleased uh, that the National Lottery got involved as well. And uh, we're, we've been able to distribute thousands of them across um, the UK. So we've involved up to 20 community stations across the UK, plus Age UK um, and many other um, CVSs, which is the voluntary services um, who, who look after food banks and that kind of thing uh, locally in their areas. So very interesting. So I'm hoping that that 40% increase in our listeners has been, <laughs> has been um, because of some of that. But it's interesting to see the stories that I've been getting in uh, from the various community projects that have been doing this about the people that have been have, getting their radios who've not had, got anything indoors, not even a television, can suddenly have a friend um, and not feeling lonely. So it's been a great project. We're finishing it up the end of this month. But I just wanted to just to add that on to, uh, to Terry, what he was talking about, the, the benefits of what, what's been going on. Great. And great. great experience again, Danny. Back to you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Aldo. And thanks, Danny. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's an innovative and, and, and an important uh, reminder of, uh, of, I suppose, of, of the social lifeline uh, that radio uh, can provide. Uh, what we're going to do, we're, uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, but we still have some time. It's about uh, uh, 10 to 12 uh, uh, Irish time at the moment. 
Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pass back to Vinod. Uh, I know that he's got some uh, uh, questions, I think, both from Zoom and perhaps from some of the people uh, uh, watching on, uh, on Facebook, and, uh, and he'll, uh, he'll lead uh, the next uh, portion, Vinod. Uh, Andrew, uh, Salvo, oh, it's yourself. I'll, Sorry, I'll take Kanchan. on the question my, and answer. My, 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 <laughs> not a problem. You, Thank you so Sorry much. Not at yes. all. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks. It's been an engaging discussion. Such wonderful insights, both from the point of view of academics and uh, from uh, coming from the practitioners, of course. So much of learning there for uh, community radio sectors in other regions, uh, especially, you know, the working of the CRAOL, you know, uh, the uh, how community radio fund is managed, and then, you know, your take uh, on digitization, the digitalization, and of course, you know, the opportunity to reinforce the localness and how the community is being engaged. We have questions uh, which have come both, you know, on the chat. And of course, on Facebook also, and there are people who've raised their hands. So I'm going to start with uh, uh, the first person who raised the hand, and that is Professor Vinod Pavdala. So we'll we'll give him the first question, and then we'll go to the others. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you uh, for that really engaging uh, discussion. Uh, I have a couple of very quick uh, questions. Uh, one is uh, uh, addressed to Rosemary Day. Uh, Rosemary, I, I, I know I brought up something you said in uh, one of the books about, uh, you, know, you, you said something about how media do not create community, but they can help build it. Uh, and that kind of, you know, uh, and, and you discuss about how community radios help uh, build communities and for community development. And during this long phase of lockdowns uh, and the pandemic, the kind of things that we are talking about, you know, I mean, self-isolation, people being in quarantine, the stigma of those who are tested positive, uh, the idea of social distancing and so on. It seems just the exact opposite of community solidarity. I mean, has, has there been sort of the, you know, a fraying of the threads that bind community radio station to, a, to the community? Or are there interesting ways in which you reinvent uh, community solidarity uh, through the pandemic and also in a sort of digital age that some others have talked about? Yes, yeah, so that's my first question. The second, you know, very quickly, uh, I mean, I'm really struck uh, by Jenny's uh, very uh, vivid image of uh, the analog cul-de-sac and, uh, and, and what she said about uh, the need for avoiding getting into that uh, blind alley. Uh, has it been the same for all community radio stations within UK? Uh, and of course, how has the situation been in Ireland? Uh, for example, I'm thinking of uh, black, Asian, minority, ethnic uh, radio stations. I mean, have, they, uh, have uh, those stations been at a disadvantage in terms of uh, digital resources and being uh, able to switch over to DAV and so on. Uh, and again, has, has this transition been very different in Ireland? Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. So, yeah. You want to? I'd better unmute first. Thanks, Fina. Um, so the, 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 some of the answers that I would have for that go back to first principles. So community is all about communication. And I really don't think it matters whether that communication is through radio, television, podcasting, or whatever. So that's not the issue. Uh, but the issue is if people are used to using radio because it's cheap and accessible and requires very little literacy um, you know, and very little training to start up and because people have it generally in their homes, um, then we need to see how, we, how that can be used during the pandemic. And um, the difficulty, as Sally said, was that stations were in lockdown and in most stations, only one to three people were allowed into the station at a time and nearly all broadcasting came from people's bedrooms. So while um, stations have been pretty successful in staying on air and in providing uh, interesting material, both advice and entertainment, um, from their bedrooms or from their kitchen tables. 
the danger and the fear would be that some people would think that this is good enough and it's not going to be good enough. So once lockdown lifts, once the pandemic eases, the crucial thing is not that people should stop broadcasting from their homes, that's a very useful thing to continue, but the question will be how do you bring people back into a central location? So I think that the radio station is a good physical location. Also the events that the station runs are useful, but it will be important not to have individuals who are isolated from their own, um, voluntarily isolating themselves and not coming into contact with members of the community. And so if you look at um, some of the initiatives that um, have been used in Ireland, like creating WhatsApp groups for all of their volunteers, like conti uh, continuing off-air uh, contact by phone calls, by Zoom meetings, etc. Um, the emphasis there is not really so much on giving information, it's not on broadcasting, but it's on maintaining the socialising aspect, maintaining the, uh, the connection and the connectivity. And so maybe to touch on some of the things that Jamie and uh, Terry brought up about technology and DAB in particular and small scale DAB. In Ireland, when we first started looking at DAB, it, back in, before 1995, in fact, around about that time, um, the commercial stations here uh, didn't get on board with the state broadcaster, with RTE. And community radio stations who were struggling financially on FM said we would wait until we saw what way things would go. And up until now, 25 years later, in 2020, DAB has not taken off in Ireland. Online listening in Ireland may have increased during the pandemic, but we don't have any proof of that at the moment. Um, Irish radio listeners or Irish communities listen to the radio primarily on FM. And 83% of all Irish people listen to radio, um, FM radio, be it the state broadcaster, the public service broadcaster, commercial radio, or community radio, on a daily basis. It's a very high figure. That percentage decreases as people grow younger. So certainly, as Jamie says, they're moving online. They're listening more and more through their, 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 their ear, um, or earbuds or whatever. Um, but they're very um, loyal to FM radio. And my concern is not that uh, we should be Luddite and be afraid to move away from FM radio, but rather that we could become too complacent and that we could become too radio-centric. So we have always talked about the importance of building the community, of developing the community, of community communication and engagement. And I think most of the community radio stations in Ireland have been ahead of commercial stations in their use and their adoption of new social media platforms. So going back to the arrival of Facebook, the student community stations were very quick to adopt those um, platforms and they taught the other older um, age group based stations. Nowadays, things like WhatsApp and Instagram in particular are hugely important for community radio volunteers and listeners as ways of, of interacting with each other. But those platforms raise huge um, moral questions for, for, for us. So while they're very useful and it's easy um, to interact with people and while we can do like commercial stations do, we can stay in touch with our audience off air and we can have a measure of what seems to be participation. I would call it as Shirley White's as pseudo participation where people think that they're actively involved by putting up a post or by liking something or by becoming a friend of the station. I think we need to use those platforms in far more innovative ways. We, we shouldn't just follow what's done. The other two dangers I see with those platforms, you know, and this is, I hope is answering your question in relation to how do we build community and um, through media. I think we need to be very careful about you know, the, the, the capitalist nature of the ownership of those platforms. So it's not just that we are packaging our listeners and selling them to advertisers, but it's also that we are confirming and reinforcing the relationships that citizens have with information outlets and with their entertainment media. So we need to um, really work on our media literacy for our volunteers first, and then for the general community. 
So we should be leaders in highlighting not just fake news, but also how the media can very easily manipulate us and how um, we can find other ways of expressing ourselves. If our aim is to provide voices for the voices, then we don't want to repl replicate those very bad relationships that minorities, uh, people who are marginalized, um, huge, huge proportions of populations, so women, for example, you know, 52% of the world, have been marginalized by. And so we need to look carefully at some of the practices that community radio stations are also using on new social media platforms that are not helpful, that are not enabling, that are actually disempowering and disenfranchising people. So I'm thinking in particular of the idea of likes and of posting pictures of yourself. So not just young women, but people of all ages desperately seeking affirmation um, for the way they look and using filters and using changing ways of changing themselves because we're taught we can't be happy with ourselves unless we buy these products or unless we look um, in a certain way uh, within or even outside of our culture. So those are things that I, I think are the biggest challenge for community radios as community media going forward. And I'd like to just take this opportunity to say that the radio station, the community radio station that we currently have, going forward, broadcasting live on air may not be the most important media um, activity that we have, but it should always stay or it will always stay as a very reliable um, stream, as a way of training people, but most importantly, as a location for people to come into, to connect with other groups uh, and to keep that diversity and to keep people literally seeing each other. And then when they move on to other social media, the training that they've got and the experience of working collaboratively with each other for the community, within the community will stay. So my, my, my vision of the future, I suppose, post pandemic, and looking at maybe only two years, four years down the line is, the radio station will become a hub, a physical location where people will meet to network and to, to socialize and to plan programs both on and off the air. So development programs, not just off air programs or, or offline programs like podcasts, but actually um, training programs or um, you know, social um, benefit, programs for social benefit. And on that last issue, um, coming back to what our regulator, the BAI, have been doing to support community radio pre-pandemic times, um, in the last two years, the, the, the BAI, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, have funded a really interesting um, research project, which uh, is called um, uh, Social Benefit, Researching Social Benefit, a toolkit for community radio stations. And this was launched a month ago, and I think people globally will find it really relevant. The idea behind it was to do um, to, to let people know what community radio does, that we're not the same as commercial stations. Uh, this point was raised early by Sally and others. How do we let politicians know when they come to legislate? And how do we let funders, NGOs, etc., come to know that really radio is not the most important aspect, it's what we're doing in communities and how we use our communication tools, of which radio is one, to do that. So this um, toolkit um, gives a number of very useful um, uh, research methodologies that can then be collated and uh, sent as part of applications for funding or as a support for um, lobbying uh, groups such as CMA in England or CMFE or AMARC, Europe Global AMARC, uh, in order to try and um, gain more awareness of community media and also gain um, more support for them. And it's a very practical toolkit and very easily um, put together. So I would urge people all over the world to have a look at that. It's from um, a research company called Nexus, and you'll find it on the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland's website, and it's called uh, Social Benefits, a Toolkit for uh, Community Radio Stations. So I think that that's very helpful. Um, I hope I've covered your questions, Leonard. I'm not sure have I run away a bit there. Yeah, thank, thank you. We'll, we'll go to Jenny. So, sure, I can, I can in there. I, mean, I, I think uh, Rosemary's brought up a very important point of the uh, of the value of volunteers at the, at the uh, at, at, of community radio. That our volunteers are very important, 
But there are volunteers in all sorts of sectors. And the thing about volunteer media and volunteer radio and indeed volunteer TV, volunteer broadcasting, is that we do broadcast to an audience. And, and I really do believe that, yes, the volunteers are, of course, important and everything we do for the volunteers. But what we're also doing is we're going out to an audience. And, and what we've been doing over the pandemic and what community stations have been doing has been have been broadcasting to either to cheer up to give information to put people in touch and that's to our audience and i think we should never lose that contact with our audience going back to a couple of other points when uh, vinod was asking about this is does is analog at risk of being in a cul-de-sac well i don't think so but every now and again i, I do get worried about it this morning in my email i had um a I'm on, you know, I'm on circulation list. So I got a, a press release coming out from the DCMS saying that commercial national broadcasters, so in, in the UK, it's people like Classic FM and Absolute and so on, they can get a 10-year extension to their current analog license if they are on digital. Now, in a way, that is beginning to show uh, the thinking they're thinking, if you're digital, okay, we'll throw in another 10 years of analog. Um, it's not forever, it's 10 years. So where are we going? And I think we have to go back to our young listeners here. Where are they going? What are they going to be listening to? I think it's interesting that Terry mentioned that he listens differently in his home to in his car. Well, I'm sorry, and I take it, I'm taking myself as a sample of one. In my car, I listen to DAB and I swap around and I turn around and every now and again, I, if I'm on a long journey, I'll download, I'll download podcasts or from the BBC or maybe one-off podcasts which are unbroadcastable elsewhere um, and I'll listen in my car. That's common. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, you know, you, you look at our audience figures that is becoming increasingly common. I mean, half the population, that there's lots of people doing that kind of thing and it's increasing and young people are listening. I'm, where I am unusual is I'm old and doing it. Young people are doing it all the time. Terry does it more than me, I don't doubt, because he's that much younger. But, um, when I come in the house, if I'm in my bedroom, I listen on FM, because that's the only thing that will pick up in my bedroom. If I go to the kitchen, I can listen on DAB, and if I'm at my desk, I'm listening online. I don't think that I'm that unusual. And as I say, I'm old compared to all of this. If you're 20, 30 years younger than me, you've already got it hacked. You know, this is, this is, is becoming commonplace. So is FM risking being, uh, going into a cul-de-sac? And where I'm thinking here is if the big commercial stations and the public service broadcaster, BBC in the UK, if they are investing, and this comes down to money, if they're putting their investment in digital, and we're not just talking about DAB, we're talking about digital online, and uh, there is a substantial number of people who listen on their TVs. Yeah, they, they're, it, radio is part of a package, and indeed community television is, is on TV. People are using their TVs as a receiver. So that's... <laughs> That's happening, you know. That that's that's coming on, um, and so and they're now saying uh, that about sixty percent of listening is done. Now that's not one person. Going back to my sample, people aren't just. There's not one way that one person listens. One person listens in a number of ways, and if community radio doesn't cater for those ways in some shape, way or form, I think that we are, we risk as a community radio sector of going into a cul-de-sac. Going back to what you were saying, Rosemary, I fully understand that there are, we have a number of listeners who are financially in very, in very dire situations and they're not going to be able to afford everything. And I accept, you know, the giving away radios is, is a fantastic way of actually just serving that. Um, but it was interesting you said that your volunteers were producing radio in their kitchens and in their bedrooms and then the stations were broadcasting that. Well, I'm kind of saying, how did they get that audio 
from their station or from, you know, from, from their bedroom, from their kitchen. My hunch is they sent it via the internet. Yeah, they sent it as an audio file. Yes, so, so they have, your volunteers, they've got internet access. And I suspect they may well be listening to the station online. So I think, I know that this is difficult for community stations, um, but I think if we want to continue to be a vibrant sector, we are going to have to be, we're going to be, have to be innovative. And I think that was a really interesting thing that Rosemary was saying, that the community can be innovative in terms of technology. And I, I think we should be looking at what we can do. Can I respond to that just briefly? Just to clarify, um, all of our station volunteers who are producing here are obviously doing so across the internet. And, you know, it depends on what part of the country they're in, how good their internet broadband is. I'm looking at my signal here, I'm in the west of Ireland, and it's telling me that my bandwidth is very low. However, all of the, the audio that's been produced at the moment is being produced remotely and very definitely people are um, on the internet and they're uh, digitally competent and as Terry said, they're delighted to discover that they can do so much more through Audacity, through clean feed, through whatever, uh, through their mobile phones than they thought was possible. So that was not the issue. The difficulty in Ireland by comparison to the UK is, is um, we don't use DAB. DAB has not taken off and um, there are very few stations that are actually on, the, on DAB. Our public service broadcaster has reduced its stations from something like 20 down to four in its pilot phase and it's not decided which way, we don't know which way to go. But every community radio station in Ireland streams, does live streaming, every community radio station in Ireland has uh, podcasts, both of um, programs that have gone out on air and of additional materials. So they're certainly not behind um, technologically, they're very well advanced, but it was the DAB issue I was mentioning there. One maybe um, interesting uh, anecdote, I suppose, is that uh, there's a radio station in the west of Ireland in County, uh, sorry, no, in the middle of Ireland in Athlone, and uh, this community radio station took the decision, as most did, to um, not to affiliate with any um, church. And so uh, they don't broadcast any religious programming. But when the pandemic hit, the local Catholic priest uh, approached Athlone Community Radio Station and said he would like to be able to broadcast uh, mass to his uh, parishioners. And so they uh, gave him the technology, set him up, I'm not sure if it's in his bedroom, but in his house. And um, that has proven to be very successful. And Athlone Community Radio Station are quite uh, pleased and surprised with the increase in uh, listeners because uh, the faithful who attended Mass both weekly and daily uh, appreciated being able to continue to worship. Uh, they have stayed on air, on FM as it happens, uh, and listened to some of the fantastically appropriate local programming. So sometimes when we as community radio stations, this is a different point, are so um, particular about not being um, exclusive and certainly in our case in Ireland being very aware of religion and trying not to tie ourselves to religion, trying to be secular, uh, sometimes we, we may be missing an opportunity and certainly this has proven to be the, the case in this one instance uh, in Ireland. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, that's a lot of food for thought on accessibility, community, technology, digital divide, and all, and, and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, things there. But I'll uh, like to go to the next question, which has come on the Facebook from Michael Meslier. Maybe Sally could take this. Uh, what, is the uh, what is the organization's stand on the infodemic and integrity issues and challenges arising out of the COVID-19 situation? Uh, Sally, would you like to uh, take this question? And Terry, otherwise? More about, you know, the credibility of information that is available and, uh, you know, the infodemic they are saying uh, in, in the times of pandemic. All right. so, sorry. Sorry, uh, Terry, there you are. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, I'm still here. Um, so the question was about the, the credibility of, of information. Yeah, they're saying, you know, uh, integrity issues about the information uh, that you find uh, uh, on uh, radio and uh, the issue of infodemic, they're calling it, you know, the uh, uh, excess of information and fake information that you find on community radio. Sure. I, I, well, I'm sorry, who, who was that trying to talk at the same time? Someone? Yeah. No, just me. So I, I was going to say that uh, I guess one of the the things about being a UK uh, community radio station is that you're regulated by Ofcom, and and there are uh, there's a broadcast code to adhere to, and 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 it's important that you don't spread uh, disinformation or, or or just false information um, uh, on on the airwaves and. I, it takes me back all the way back to the start of March when it became apparent to, to me that um, there was a good chance that the radio station, the university uh, where we're based, was going to have to have some sort of uh, closure of its doors. Um, and there was a lot of panic and a lot of, uh, well, frankly, rumours uh, being spread. And I had to uh, get our volunteers on board with not sharing uh, information that was at that point beyond what the official guidance was. That's the only way I could really uh, play it because I didn't know the true answers. No one really knew at that point um, what this virus um, w was going to do. And yet I had some uh, volunteers saying, oh, I hear the virus makes you um, have, you know, horrible diarrhea or whatever. And, and, and <laughs> that's, that wasn't even the case. But, but so, we start, so don't say that on air. The, the official line is this from from Public Health England, and that's the information that we will talk about the virus. Uh, we will talk about news items when we have our news programming, but but generally, other than playing the the, the public service announcements that the UK government uh, created, uh, we we tried not to give too much opinion on the virus uh, in those early days, and and I think. I can't speak for every community radio station in the UK, but I think on the whole, that's been what people have done. They've not tried to become medical experts and, and giving their own opinion as fact, but they are trying to, to, I guess, try and find the good news stories around. And you hear that a lot on UK radio, the, the good news stories that, that came uh, as a result of the pandemic, because there are plenty of them. And, and that, that's generally been the focus. I'm not necessarily sure that answers the question, but I, ultimately it is important uh, not to, to spread information unless it's absolutely verified as fact and, and, and maybe the bigger news organisations are the ones more qualified and able to do that at this time, not so much uh, UK community radio station would be volunteers. All right, thank you. And we have a couple of uh, more questions which are related to uh, community participation during the pandemic. So we have Sapna Nayak of Mysore University. She asked this question, you know, kindly let us know the crucial role played by community radio in the present pandemic in involving the community members. And we have another question which is related to this and that is from Sujata. Uh, she is asking how did the community radio stations focus on the more vulnerable sections during the pandemic? Uh, you know, uh, it, it is said that black and Asian community has been disproportionately affected. So is there some, uh, you know, uh, programming that is specially directed to them? Who would like to take that? Okay, Jenny, I see you. you'll have to unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I, and I, I, I cannot claim a huge amount of knowledge on this, but I can. Uh, I know that my colleague um, uh, Javad uh, up in his uh, Glasgow station, which is particularly for the Asian community, I know that they have um, been trying to help their particular community in, in a number of ways. Actually, going back to the previous question, I think one of the things that the community stations have been very keen to do is to debunk these extraordinary rumours going around uh, in the UK, and I'm sure elsewhere, I'm sure in Italy and elsewhere, there was not only misinformation about the actual illness itself um, and its causes and effects and, and so on, but there was a great deal of misinformation about 
what the government were asking people to do. I mean, uh, the, the, the rumours going around, well, the, the stories going around social media about um, the, what, was, uh, what was legal and what was not legal and what was required and what was not required was, was quite extraordinary. And in particular, I think older populations and indeed maybe people whose first language was not, was not English were finding this particularly difficult. And I, I know that Javad Station um, uh, AWOS was particularly keen in his area to ensure that um, their, their community was properly informed by, uh, by the, inform in the information that we were being given and the requirements that we were being put on us uh, during the lockdown. Um, and during that time as well, uh, this, this, was, um, this was Ramadan for the uh, Islamic community. And so they were, as going back to what Rosemary was saying, I mean, they during Ramadan, the stations do um, support their community anyway by giving the, the time of uh, sunrise and sunset and so on, and by having prayers and things. And they were very keen that they would support their community during the Ramadan period um, to, to make sure that they felt that they were, they were part. Uh, I remember one of the things that he spoke about was that... Um, uh, at the end of Ramadan, and I, and I do beg my pardon, you know, do beg your pardon, there will be people on this, uh, on this forum who, who have much more knowledge than me, but there is um, an evening meal, uh, where, which is a celebration. And uh, of course, coming up to Eid, there is a huge celebration. And I do know that the uh, stations serving is Islamic communities were, were very keen to make sure that there was a feeling of uh, celebration and community in those periods. Yeah, sorry, Rosemary wants to come in on yeah, things. Uh, yeah, I thought, uh, Sally, would you like to add to this? Uh, Sally, are you able to hear me? Yeah, would you like to add to this? Uh, and tell us about how uh, you go about making the community participate in your programs? Well, it was difficult during the lockdown, obviously, because we couldn't involve them in any way as they, we, weren't, uh, we weren't accessing the studios and people were producing from home. Mm -hmm. The community we reached was our community of volunteers in some way. On mm -hmm. the other hand, I think that it was the approach of the information we were offering through the programs that was of uh, a kind of outreach to the community because the focus of the current affairs content produced at the time was very much about services that were available in the local community. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, a special opening hours for senior citizens because they were supposed to be cocooning mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. vulnerable groups, etc., etc. What shops were open in the local area. Also, mm -hmm. the, so, uh, in Ireland, there was uh, an initiative called the Community Call. So it, this was for people who were cocooning or who were on the vulnerable, vulnerable group or they have been diagnosed with COVID-19 to be able to contact the local authorities or groups of volunteers then will do their shopping, go to the uh, chemists for them, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very much a kind of public service mm -hmm. uh, content we produced. But as I'm telling you, at that time, it was difficult actually to, okay. be, to be involved in the community. Of course, mm -hmm. through email, Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. we got message from the community, people who were interested in doing an interview to promote the service they were offering, et cetera, et cetera. So we did that, but it was a bit, um, it's not what I will understand as involved in the community, obviously, because we want to be broader than that. From the point of view of the uh, mm -hmm. other minority communities in, mm -hmm. in Ireland, I don't think that there is a clear breakdown of data. I don't mm -hmm. know if I, maybe Andrew and, uh, Gross may, may knew more about this, but I think that the data that we have about the incidence of COVID-19 is on the general population. There hasn't been a breakdown based on ethnicity or so mm -hmm. it's not very clear. We know, for example, there have been reports that the Filipino community has been one of the most affected mm -hmm. by COVID-19, but I think in some ways it may be related to the area of work because most Filipino pe uh, people in Ireland will be involved in working in hospitals and also in uh, care, care and nursing centers. So I suppose the incidence has been higher in the community because it seems like they are more, uh, more about uh, working in that sector and that sector has been obviously highly 
uh, affected by COVID-19. Yeah. And uh, can I make, mention something really that yes. I wanted to, to say about the participation and the digital, digital issue? Okay, yes. so I think that we have forgotten about the, the, to mention the digital divide. Mm -hmm. And this is something that still exists in, in, in many countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's true the technology is there for everyone to use and enjoy. But there are, in some cases, economic reasons or technological issues or skills issues that are affecting people's access to new technologies, okay? Mm -hmm. I think that the role of community radio, obviously, is to train our staff and volunteers to be completely IT literate and to mm -hmm. be able to use all this technology mm -hmm. and to offer that technology to people who, who can use it. But coming to accessibility, I think we have to always look to the lower common denominator. And this is the person who doesn't have any of those skills or don't have that access. So they are able to connect to the radio station and listen to it on FM because that's the only way that they can do it. Okay. Um, and then finally, there was something said that really worried me because it shows really that approach to community radio that I think is trying to keep us in a kind of precariousness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, this concept that actually we are edgy because we don't have a lot of funding, I think mm -hmm. it's wrong. I think community radio is edgy. The, I mean, our, the fact that we broadcast or produce very specialized and sometimes niche content is not because of the funding. It's a political mm -hmm. decision, basically, by community mm -hmm. radios. Mm -hmm. And I think that more funding actually will allow us to produce even, even more niche and more specialized a more edgy content, okay? So uh, I don't think one thing is excluding the other. And I think that precisely that precariousness is stopping us from producing some of that content for uh, actually allowing our volunteers and staff to be more digitally aware or literate, okay? Sure. During this pandemic, for example, I have discovered that some people in the radio station that can use a computer, couldn't mm -hmm. work from home because they didn't have a computer at home. Sure. Because they are, being, they are in a precarious situation because we don't have funding and they can't afford it. Okay, okay. or they lacked of what's all that they couldn't do digital editing at home. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think it's important to understand that funding is necessary. And if we are talking about diversity of voices, and how important this is, and how important is the media literacy, and how important is the social benefit, and how important is the community building that community media is doing, okay, money should be put behind it to support it. And sure. this is uh, how I see it. Sure, sure. I just wanted to invite uh, Vivian uh, to make a comment. Uh, would you be able to come uh, uh, switch on your mic and uh, make the comment that you were uh, putting in the chat, Vivian. Yes, yeah. thank you so much, uh, yes, Mali. You can hear me. Yeah, we can. Yes, I wanted to just comment and say that I agree with what Solidarity is saying mm -hmm. in terms of the existence of the you know the digital divide, because here in the global south, I'm from Zimbabwe, yeah. and you find that in as much as we're talking about high, uh, okay, the need to you utilize online platforms uh, in content distribution, you find that there are real challenges when it comes to access, especially by marginalized rural communities, challenges related to limited pen internet penetration in their areas of residence, mm -hmm. challenge also related to high data costs uh, to enable access, and also generally literacy challenges on how mm -hmm. to make use of online platforms by our target audiences. Uh, you further find that when it comes also to volunteer retention, you you at times battle to find ways of trying to retain volunteers so that you are able still to get content on a more so getting volunteers who have the relevant expertise to operate mm -hmm. online platforms to get content out there and lastly uh there was a discussion around uh dub and how it's being used for example in uk for us here in the global south, more specifically, focus or no focus at all on radio. 
So I'm not sure uh, uh, um, how best we can try to also mitigate the challenge or try to explore even opportunities that are out there so that we are still able to save our communities. Okay. Uh, all right. I think we've uh, lost uh, Vivian. Uh, I'll uh, just like to bring in Steve for a minute uh, for a quick uh, uh, question, which I had in mind. And that was basically, if you could give us some idea about the community radio sector, uh, you know, within the community radio sector, how much of programming is actually dependent on volunteers and how much of it is carried out by the staff? If just give us a quick idea and then we have one more question to go. Yeah. Yeah, let me just share a little bit about um Mm -hmm. our experience here in Sheffield, I think we're a little unique really, but we've because we've taken from an early stage mm -hmm. the view that community media needs to be cross-platform and multimedia. Um, and we started as an internet um, and short-term broadcaster before we got an FM license. We've been podcasting for 10 years. We won the local TV license for Sheffield um, uh, five, six years ago. Um, so we're now on on uh, FM and digital television and podcasting and the internet and cable TV. And we're about to uh, get involved in our next new adventure, which is to acquire a small scale digital audio broadcasting multiplex, which will enable us to carry 18 to 20 radio stations in Sheffield. And we're beginning to think about how many, what, what those 18 radio stations should be. And we're not looking at that entirely from a commercial point of view, but looking at all the diversity that we can bring to our city. Uh, as a gift to our population. Um, we have around about 200 volunteers involved um, and we have three paid staff um, and we broadcast 24-7 TV and 24-7 radio. And um, the, we have also have two freelance journalists. Um, uh, so the, the community radio actually has no paid staff. The staff are employed through the TV side, which does earn a little bit of money and some grant aid and so on. The community radio runs on a budget of £20,000 a year um, and it's really entirely volunteer run. Um, we ran out of money some years ago with the radio um, and realised that it was going to have to be done on a voluntary basis. So we gave everybody keys to the door um, and they come and go um, and, and they make their programmes. Um, so you know, we've, we've developed quite a resilient model, I think. It's been, it's been very challenging, um, but but you know, it's highly dependent on volunteers. Um, and, and without the volunteers, it wouldn't happen. And you know, during the COVID phase, I think we've seen you know, some very exciting developments for us. I mean, first of all, you know, a large number of our volunteers, as other people have said, um, you know, are people who themselves are vulnerable. Um, or, uh, many of them are older people or they're people with um, various health problems. That's why they are involved in community radio because they have the time and it gives them a uh, social opportunity and it gives them, uh, you know, it, it, it contributes to their identity and their esteem and their engagement um, in ways that would be difficult for them uh, for other reasons. Um, so, so that's been very important and, and we've, you know, we've, from, the, from the outset we tried to make sure that, you know, our volunteers were able to participate from a distance um, uh, during this period, you know, buying bits of kit and so on um, and providing technical support to them. Um, so we so we ran the operation, you know, almost entirely uh, from remote working um, with just a couple of people coming in to the studios. But the, one of the most interesting things has been um, through this period, um, in, audiences increased um, by 50% on TV, by about 40% on radio, um, and people have come to us saying, "Well, we were going to do this event in a in a series of halls or in a park, and we no longer can do it. Can you help us get it to audience?" Mm -hmm. And we've built new partnerships through this process. That's been the most exciting part of the community participation, if you like. We've made linkages with others. Um, last week, we broadcast the Migration Matters Festival. Um, we, we allocated airtime across radio and across TV for a festival that happened online only, but, but also on TV and on, 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 on the radio, uh, which normally would have been a physical event. And it was a festival celebrating migration, celebrating migration culture, celebrating the contribution of migrants, uh, of theatre, of Zoom-based discussions, um, of, uh, of dance, uh, and, and of musical presentation. Um, and we were able to put it across, you know, across all of our platforms. So, you know, we, we, we see ourselves as simply offering a platform to the community and creating that space for those partnerships and that participation. 
Um, and, you know, the volunteering, um, I think, although some volunteers have faced real challenges, we've also been approached by volunteers wanting to help us to make this work. So we actually doubled our news team from two freelancers to, to adding um, uh, four part-time student volunteers that came into the mix. So we were able to produce more news content through this period. So we've increased content, we've increased audience, we've increased volunteering. Um, and I think we're going to come out of this also with increased finance and a much stronger organization. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, we, I, I think we're taking a little extra time, but then there's one question for Danny. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Tejrani to please ask her question. Tejrani, you're there. Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah, please, go everyone. Um, I just completed my PhD work and it was on community radio in South Asia. And one of the interest areas was around um, partnerships and networking opportunities. And because of the diversity of cultures in the South Asian region, you look at all these different languages that they have, it's very hard for them to share content. However, it seems to be very different in UK and Ireland specifically because you have a common language to some degree. Um, apart from funding, because I think we've exhausted that to some extent, funding and um, training, are there any other types of resources being shared? For example, similar programs in an attempt to cut down on the amount of work that a station has to do? Yeah. Danny, you want to take that? Uh, please unmute yourself. Hi, yeah. Yeah. There. Hi, yeah. Yes. Um, well, over here, the BBC have been, um, when the pandemic started, we, we've always had a, an MOU and uh, with the Memorandum of Understanding with the BBC. Um, and during the, um, when the pandemic started, uh, we managed to um, secure uh, a deal for community broadcasters to be able to, to download or uh, use their resources, um, and not just in uh, English languages, but in many uh, other languages as well. And I thought that was very useful uh, for the different uh, diverse community radio stations out there. Um, and so that was that cut down on quite a lot of the um, of of um, workload for stations. It's up to the stations whether they wanted to to take them up on that offer uh, or not. And that was basically rolling news um, and BBC sounds. Um, we run. Um, I run a, a, an organisation called the Radio Hub, which is a networking uh, organisation uh, here in the UK, um, which um, meets. Uh, at different points around the UK at different times of the year. And I can tell you that we've had quite a lot of um, um, diverse um, community radio stations come along and be part of, um, of uh, sharing best practice um, in other languages as well, which has been quite interesting, um, pulling on, uh, on the resources. But it is a, it's an interesting question about resources uh, in, in whatever language you're in, really, and, and to overcome... Uh, barriers in in sharing information um, and I hope that in the future we'll be able to um, you know th this group today is made up of um, groups across uh, the world and uh, hopefully in, in the future we'll be able to look at ways of um, of sharing um, information together I could just about hear you sorry yeah. thank you so much thank you and uh, I'll hand it back to the moderators now and also to the chair for thanking the panelists. Please. Jenny had a point before leaving. Quick, if you can. Uh, unmute yourself. Here we go. Yeah. One of the, and I'm well aware that, in fact, at various points, stations have tried to share some programs. And, and, and indeed, some programs are obvious to share, and in particular, where language groups may be. Uh, you know, in the north and south of the country, there may be different uh, language groups who, who who speak the same language, but but generally, the very notion of community broadcasting in the UK is that you will be serving the community around you. I mean, even fairly geographically local, not totally necessarily, but uh, but fairly geographically local. Now, it could well be that there there are some particular um, so I've just lost me thing here, but um, there are some particular uh, groups um, who, who require certain programming and certainly they, they could be shared. Um, but 
but I think sharing is is almost contrary to some of the principles that we're that we're working towards. Rosemary, quickly, if you can. Very quick. I, need to close I, I was going to make the exact same point that Jamie has made. And so if you're finding it difficult to produce enough programming for your community, then you need to look at, at, at you know, why, what are you doing? Um, are you doing too many hours? Do you need to train more volunteers? The whole point of being relevant to your community and serving your community and having broadcasting that has come in from your community means that sharing programs that are being produced for another region or a different community often won't work. But we have had some very successful uh, national collaborations through our organization, CRAIL, and also internationally through things like the World Community Radio Day. So when uh, stations connect and network off air and offline, um, and decide to run a weekend of special radio programs that will be broadcast on all stations in a country or in a region. That can be really exciting and, and successful. Or in the past, through the funding we get from the scheme called Sound and Vision, which is to enable stations to make public service type programming, sometimes three or four stations will come together or even the entire network in Ireland, and they will work on a series of programs that are maybe issue-based, maybe around things like diversity or race or mental health or um, you know, different issue-based programs. And they're most valuable when those are supported by new social media applications and by off-air training and uh, delivery. Um, so so that, that I think I concur with, with Jamie there. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Can I, can I say something about uh, program sharing? Quickly again. Yeah, very quickly. Thank you. Uh, during COVID-19, uh, Creole created a kind of bank on an online server so people could share the programs. And for the last two years, community radios are in Ireland are producing a weekly um, news and current affairs program, a 30 minutes one that basically brings together interviews from all across the country and is coordinated by NIRFM. So we get the interviews, put it together as a program, send back the program and the individual interviews with their intros. So people can use either the whole program or, so yes, we, we, there is an ongoing sharing of information and programming. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. Sorry to be, yeah. <laughs> To keep it keeping the time, but I guess you know they you, with the, the bringing together two countries, which is such a rich experience, we could stay in. I think uh, even for the whole weekend and still not be able to to do that. Uh, but I'm sure these conversations will continue uh, afterwards in some form. And I, I know that uh, there is a plan from Vinod and the team uh, to have this available in a different form. Uh, Vinod, should we come to you for some concluding remarks there? Uh do you and Andrew have uh, something to conclude? I mean, otherwise, I mean, my, mine is just a ceremonial conclusion. So. Okay. In yeah. which case, I'll pass uh, over to Andrew for a moment for some Andrew? concluding remarks. Okay. Add a bit Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. As uh, Salvo mentioned, it, it really has been uh, a very rich uh, uh, event. And I think uh, we could indeed keep talking. And I think as I've been, uh, as I've been listening, I've been taking notes and, uh, lots of different areas that have that have uh, come through and and ideas for for different things. Um, it's been interesting to to hear uh, reiterated um, uh, the, the 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 role of community, the role the role of uh, uh, in their particular space, um, and thinking about what uh, what's particular. Uh, about about stations and what they what they add what they provide to audiences and to, and more broadly um, issues of uh, of finance obviously uh, popping up uh, here and there uh, or you know as as just as a continuous uh, background level noise uh, to work in this area I think um, but. But also, uh, I think I, I, I hope that those listening uh, will have heard 
the vibrance of the sector here uh, in, in these two islands and in these two jurisdictions. Um, and the way in which, as you know, Sally's uh, mentioned there of, uh, of, of, of stations collaborating and sharing uh, content uh, in ways that, you know, uh, that allow us to, to gain from each other. I know um, one of the uh, projects that I've been uh, involved, involved with to some extent uh, in recent years has been um, with uh, one, one led by the Broadcasting Authority, the, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland here, the BAI, um, uh, jump-started um, what's now Media Literacy Ireland, uh, an effort to, to engage with questions of media literacy. Um, and that's something where uh, members, you know, those active in community radio and in community media and, and uh, uh, are able to engage with academics and also with the other sectors, public service and commercial, um, in thinking about our broadly about uh, the way in which we work with our with our publics um, and that's something where the um, just recently I was, I, was, I was on a call with uh, with media literacy another zoom meeting um, mm-hmm. where mention was made of the role that uh, Crail and its member stations uh, have played in in uh, uh, during the pandemic in uh, sharing a, uh, a public uh, service campaign uh, that had been running for the last uh, since last year, but gained increasing relevance uh, this year. Uh, uh, be media smart, and they have the, the three steps of uh, of stop, think, and check that they have as messages for the public. Um, but also, of course, community media um, uh, take a more maximalist approach to media literacy. Um, and I think that's important to thinking in terms of the way in which our our publics can be active citizens, active in their communities. Um, and just wonderful examples. I, I won't try to, to to list all the ones again. That people can listen to the last two and a half hours on uh, on, on Facebook again if they wish. Just the many examples of uh, of active citizenship that's facilitated uh, by the stations and by the projects and groups uh, in these areas. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I want to just get a few more uh, suggestions. Um, me and Andrew, uh, excuse me for the self-promotion here, we just released uh, the second part of uh, an open access uh, journal of alternative and community media, uh, which has been led by, uh, uh, Su- led by Susan Ford at Griffith University um, and uh, has just been moved from uh, the previous open access area to uh, open access at intellect. So if you just... Google uh, Journal of Alternative Community Media, there are two fully packed issues uh, about sustainability in community media, which can be helpful to practitioners and colleagues alike. Um, And uh, it was interesting there to note we had so many uh, submissions of Vasprax, so there was a lot of interest globally that we had, uh, and we still had to limit that to to, to two issues. So there's a lot of interesting things happening there. Uh, I know that the IMCR, the International Association of Media and Communication Research, has a very vibrant uh, community uh, communication alternative media section, which I was pleased to to co-chair for two years, where Vinod is leading. The conference this year had to be in Beijing, was moved because of the virus to Tampere, has been moved online because of the virus, and Finland was not escaping any of that, unfortunately. Um, uh, This uh, is, again, another vibrant venue where these conversations happen, uh, of course, and and I'm sure, you know, Vinod and the team there will share more information about that. I think Danny had raised his hand. I don't know if you wanted to add anything quickly, Danny Lawrence? No, I thought I raised hand. No, mind. Um, I know we have on the call as well Birgitta Yellow, who is the current president of the Community Media Forum Europe. I don't know if you can still hear us. And um, I think she's left. She's left. Okay, just a quick hello. So, um, and again, uh, it's great to see all of these here. And uh, I'm not sure probably we didn't have a lot of people from the Americas because of the time. <laughs> it's very early over there, but it's great to hear colleagues present here from, from Asia, uh, from, uh, from Europe, and also from Africa, where we share the same, more or less the same time zone. So it was Thank great you. to hear uh, Vivienne from, from Zimbabwe and, and there are colleagues over there. So on that note, I'm happy to hand you over, Vinod, uh, for the concluding ceremony, of course, Thank and to the next steps. Thank you, Vinod. Thank you so much, uh, Salvo and uh, Andrew. 
for uh, doing such a great job of moderating this uh, panel uh, with uh, so much to talk. I mean, there are so many interesting threads of conversation that we could have gone on into a conference. Uh, I, I won't even try to identify those issues again. I think you both have uh, done that already. Uh, but one of the challenges of organizing these global dialogues uh, I mean, logistically has been the time zones. I mean, to be able to think of uh, a particular time that works for everyone in the world is going to be you know, such a big challenge. So some dialogues are going to be less convenient to some, more convenient to others. But luckily, uh, we are recording all of these conversations. They are uploaded on our YouTube channel. They are also available on the Facebook page of the UNESCO chair. We are going to transcribe these dialogues and share them in print later. Uh, but thanks to all of the panelists for uh, agreeing to our request and uh, you know, uh, for, for this fascinating conversation on UK and Ireland. Uh, in about uh, 10 days time, I think uh, 12 days, uh, on July 15th, we have the next global dialogue. Uh, we'll send you a uh, you know, poster and invite again. Uh, this is going to focus on Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, so Vivian, who just uh, had a comment here, is going to be on that panel uh, from Zimbabwe, but also we have uh, panelists from South Africa, from Malawi, from Kenya, from Tanzania. Uh, so that's, that's going to be a wonderful panel. And uh, we'll hopefully follow it up with another dialogue focused on Western and Central Africa. And, uh, and one of the challenges moving into Africa and then later Central and South America uh, is linguistic. And uh, we might actually end up uh, doing two dialogues for Western and Central Africa. One with a set of Francophone uh, panelists and the other with Anglophone uh, countries. So we will be still figuring it out. But the next couple of uh, dialogues are likely to be focusing on Africa and then we'll move into other zones. So we hope to see all of you uh, joining at least uh, some of those. I know all of you are busy and you have other things to do. Salvo, you've been in Italy and uh, thanks so much for taking the time out to be here for a couple of hours. Uh, Thank you all again, and uh, we'll share you share the recording soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Vinod. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. You. Thank you.